The Baldwin County Public School System, considered one of the finest educational environments in the entire state of Alabama, has a history beginning in the latter part of the 18th century, when as records indicate, Alabama's first public schoolhouse was built in the North Baldwin County community of Tinsaw in 1799. And at that time, nearly 10 years prior to Baldwin being organized as a county, the area remained geographically expanse. Agriculture served as king, and family farms dotted every section of the county. And in this era of extremely limited highway systems, individual communities built their own respective public schoolhouses with the Board of Education supplying teachers to provide instruction. In the early part of the 20th century, the Baldwin County Public School System boasted over 80 separate school districts, each with their own individual public schoolhouse. And as time progressed, marked with improvements in transportation and engineering, numerous school districts were consolidated into nearby areas, leaving us today with very few of the original and historic public schoolhouses which distinguished Baldwin County beginning in 1799 as the birthplace of Alabama's first public schoolhouse. This documentary, commissioned by the Honorable County Commissioners of Baldwin County and Honorable Members of the Baldwin County Board of Education, seeks to illuminate these few remaining and historic original public schoolhouses in an effort to pay tribute to one of the finest public school systems in Alabama. Located on the eastern shore, the Point Clear School remained an important landmark in this expanse on incorporated community during its tenure as an educational institution in Baldwin County. From 1913 to 1917, Principal Naomi Rogers provided leadership for what was at that time a small three-room school. Students gave regular performances to be enjoyed by all those in and around the community at the old Point Clear Hotel where tables served as substitutes for the stage. Mrs. Leona Stubblefield, a teacher at the school, remembers when they were able to buy heaters for the school after the students conducted fundraisers. To help the school provide arts education as well as athletic activities, many in the community donated their time and skills to teach the school's pupils music and sports. Those who attended or taught at the Point Clear School spoke of it with very fond memories. Miss Leona Stubblefield recalls the memories of her years spent at the Point Clear School as simply sweet. Point Clear Standard School Construction, 1927 Foundation, used as an elementary school, closed early on, consolidated with Fairhope, and then in no, it was used for multiple purposes, multiple school purposes. And, and multiple community purposes. It was even rented out, and, and uh, the auditorium was the original home of Emperor Clock Company that later moved on over to Foley. Uh, that clock company was started uh, by a Fairhope man in the auditorium of the old Point Cliff School. Any time we had a shortage of classrooms somewhere in the area, there's Point Clear. We always had that to fall back on. If there was a fire, we could go to Point Clear. If the area of vocational school at Roberts Hill didn't get finished, go to Point Clear. It was even uh, used as the uh, uh, school for uh, special needs children. But one time it was the county school for special needs children, and we bust them from all over Baldwin County there, even from Baymanette. The Point Clear School is a beautiful red brick building that was located in Point Clear to combine several of the schools of the area in 1924. Point Clear actually had a frame building that served the children in that area prior to the building built in 1924. The building was built following the state approved plans with the central entranceway and a beautiful auditorium in the center with classroom wings to the right and left. The building for most of its life served students in grades one through eight 
with a very impressive graduation ceremony held each year at the Grand Hotel. My name is Pam Pittman Turner. I was a student at Point Clear School in first grade in 1949 and then the next year as well. Um, my teacher was Mrs. Wilson, Miss Edna Wilson, Miss Edna Wilson. And um, a long time we thought she was old as dirt, but we loved her. She had white hair that just sort of fitted in a, in a bun and I felt like if I touched it, it would feel like cotton or cotton candy. It was just real flowy. She wore little round glasses and was always serious. I can't remember her smiling, but we always felt like she was business-like, but she cared about us. First and second grade were in the same class. We had the little wooden desk that fit right behind each other like you see on Little House in the Prairie. And the first grade was on one side and the second grade students on the other. And I remember I, follow, I talked too much and she would take me from the first grade side over to the second grade side when it was their turn to read and the others were doing seat work. So I just moved, I just sort of shouted her a good bit. And then the next grade, um, then Mrs. Yenny was the, no, Miss Pearl Nelson was the teacher for third grade and fourth grade. And I had Miss Nelson, in fact, Miss Wilson sent me to her the next year. She was anxious for me to go. And I still talked too much, and my friend Ethel Bush was there with me as well. We had a, a linoleum rug in the middle of the floor that had cartoon characters or nursery rhyme characters around the edge of the rug. And um, we would sit on those characters. And Ethel and I always sat together on a particular character. And Ms. Nelson called my mother to come talk to her one day about my talking in class too much. And, Mother came home and Daddy said, well, how did it go? And I heard, and I don't know if they thought I was listening or not, but Mother said, well, she and Ethel are talking too much. And Daddy said, well, why doesn't Miss Nelson separate them? And she said, well, I asked her that. And Miss Nelson said, oh, it would break their hearts. So life went on. We had a great time out on the playground. We always had teams. And Ethel was kind of a ringleader of one and I of another and we'd have wars against each other. And we swept pine straw to make um, the boundaries of the forts. Occasionally we played house, but it was mostly war, I think. And uh, one of the most fun things was the slide. No, we did have a slide too, I believe, but the seesaws. And you would all stand on one side of the seesaw and everybody would run to the other end except the last person who would be bounced up in the air. And occasionally there was fall out from that with bloody noses, but we didn't care. Lots of sand spurs around that playground, which was sandy on the ground with yopon bushes and shrubbery that you could hide in for wars. And students would show off every now and then um, putting sand spurs in their mouth, and we had a couple of accidents with that. But it was free for all. It, at recess, we, at play yard. We didn't have PE teachers organizing games, but we could organize them pretty well. I should have brought my reading book. I still had the Dick and Jane little paperback reader. We had a great cafeteria. I think when I was there, Zelda was remembering bringing lunches, and I, I, I can remember doing both, but I loved eating in the cafeteria. We had those navy beans with a little ham hock in there and cornbread. And the German ladies, I believe it was, were the cooks. The food was great. Um, and then after that, we would take the proverbial trip by the, the bathroom. And you could see over the door and under the door. And, and we were kind of silly. And one day, I couldn't get out of the bathroom. I don't remember why that was. Um, but the students thought it was really funny. And they didn't tell Miss um, Nelson, it was in the third grade, that I was there for a while, but pretty soon she discovered me and I was very embarrassed. And I don't think I was the ringleader that afternoon. I think I was probably pretty quiet and a proper little girl. <laughs> um, one of the big treats that I can remember were the activities that we had in the cafeteria on stage. We had a, a stage there and we had, um, we put on performances for patriotic things. I remember doing um, a baton number on the stage with a red cape that my mother had made me. And the music was um, Stars and Stripes Forever. Maybe it was Veterans Day. 
but the parents came to watch and we all giggled behind the the screen and, and had a good time behind the curtain. I went through school there, first grade through the six. Ms. Wilson was my first teacher. I remember her better than any of them. <laughs> and um, naturally there wasn't a whole lot of us at the school, so it was we were all very close to each other, students. And um, we enjoyed being there, and we had to walk to school. And a lot of times we'd get to school before the, they opened the school, so we would have a basketball and get out there and play basketball until the bell rung. And some of the boys teased me a lot because I was short and they used to hurt my feelings. And then I was left-handed, so I couldn't stand to be teased. So I learned to eat and write with my right hand. And we, we just had a lot of fun there, you know, and I, and we did make it through Point Clear and came to Fairhope. We used to, like after school, they used our, um, our auditorium for like different things, you know, that, for entertainment. And it was usually in the evenings and parents and all were invited to come. And that kept us kind of, you know, up to date and enjoying everything. And, and uh, even, uh, I can't even remember the name of the dance that we did a lot. It was the country dance anyway, and I can't even remember the name of it now. <laughs> but, um, and, and like I say, we were all very close and, and just got along fine. When it was getting close to school being closed, uh, my girlfriend and I were so upset about it, we'd cry because we didn't want school to close. I can remember that very well because we really liked being in school, you know. And we, I think, too, we figured we weren't going to be as close seeing each other when school was closed, too. So, but, um, oh, maybe you'd like to hear this. <laughs> One of my other girlfriends, we, I don't know how it was that we were, going to her place and we were going to walk and it was doing a break or something and we we had to walk from school around down to the highway because they lived right down from the highway and on scenic 98 it is now but it wasn't no scenic 98 back then but anyway we went to her house and to pick up papers or something and and then I don't know why we decided we wanted to look like we'd been crying, so we got the, we got this, uh, oh goodness, this um, stuff that they put in your nose, you know, for colds and such, and I can't remember the name of it now. But anyway, we'd put it around close to our eyes and look like we were crying. So when we got back to school, everybody wanted to know why we were crying. <laughs> so just foolish. Silly mess, so anyway. <laughs> but that's one of the things I can remember. Most people that attended Point Clear School have fond memories of a beautiful little one-room library that was a separate building on the campus. However, the history of the library at Point Clear is even more remarkable. The library was actually the smallest public library in the United States for a while and it served Point Clear community from the night, early 1900s until 1950. At that time, uh, it stood next to Zundel's store and the post office on Highway 98 in Point Clear. Upon its closing, it was moved to the Point Clear School campus where it served that school as a public, as a library for those students that were there. As the school system 
grew and the school grew, the library was no longer used and it fell into disrepair. And thankfully, a local family came to the rescue of the building and it is preserved today by a private resident in Balling County. I went to Fort Clear School in 1938 or 39 for one year. Uh, my teacher was Miss Wilson. I remember more about her at Fort Clear than anything else. After that, the school bus started running on Green Old Road, which is Highway 98 now. I caught the bus started coming to Farrell in second grade. And the second grade was on the south end of the school building. I worked all the way around my senior year here, twelfth grade. It one door down where we're at now. Coming to Farrell was like coming from daylight to dark. Fort Clear was a small family school. It was real nice. Everybody knew each other. I really hated to leave with them. When I got to Farrell, they were all the same way. We were a small class. Everybody was like brothers and sisters. We all just joined in, and we went all the way from the second grade through the twelfth grade together. And uh, we always loved each other like brothers and sisters, and we're still doing that today. We still meet today, most of our class meet every other month, and every five years we still meet. And very few classes does that. The highlights of school was coming to school, not having to work. I, I love school because of, when we grew up, everything in Baltimore County was farming. You got off the bus, you started working, you worked the dark, and you get up in the morning, you go work before you come to school. So the reason I love school the most is I got out of work, I tell my dad, and he always wanted to whip me for it. He said, you're supposed to go to school to learn, boy. I said, well, I had more fun there, too, but it was a whole lot of fun in school, and it wasn't working for you. <laughs> so, you know, I was the first one of six boys to graduate from high school. All the rest of them had to drop out in ninth, 10th, 11th grade. My oldest brother dropped out in the 12th grade to go to World War II. So I was the first one to graduate out of the family, and it was hard back in those days because your mother and daddy both only had a first to sixth grade education, and my mother had a sixth grade education. My daddy had an eighth. I knew right from wrong and how to raise you, and that's about it. My days at Point Clear School were from 1945 through 1951, first through sixth grade. We always enjoyed Point Clear School as we had to walk a mile on dirt roads to get to school. And when we were at school, we had three classes to one room. Miss Edna Wilson taught us first through third grade, and then eventually, after several years there, we, we had no cafeteria. We had to bring our lunch. And then Miss uh, Mac Phillips started making soup for us one day a week on Fridays. We would have soup. She would bring, we had our own bowls there, and we would buy a, bo a soup for 10 cents a bowl on fr every Friday. And we had lots of fun there, playing and running and swinging and all kinds of things, activities. I had to whip a boy one time at school. I couldn't catch him, but when I got him, I worked him over good with a croquet bat. Not very ladylike. <laughs> but we did have a good time. <laughs> well, I started school in 1932 in Point Clear. And of course, I went there for six years. And uh, one of the things that I probably remember the most is the old round wood-burning stove that you had to get out there in the morning and get started before you had any heat in the room. And of course, Miss Edna Wilson taught us that. And uh, it seems like a Mrs. Garrett was in the upper grades when I got into the, from the fourth on up, but, but I don't remember for sure. When we were in school there, we, everybody used to make a, a pea shooter out of rolling paper up and gluing it. So of course, I had to be like everybody else to make one, but I saw a sand spur on somebody's thing. I picked it up and put it in and gonna blow it, and I sucked, and when I did, it ended up in my throat. <laughs> so I ended up in Mobile getting a sand spur taken out of my throat. <laughs> my days at Old Point, at Point Clear School, for well, the fifth and the sixth grade. And we had a great time. We had a good teacher, Ms. Stapleton. And we used to do the Virginia Reel, 
least once or twice a week and we did some other dances. And what else did we do? Oh, and we had a pump out in the back to pump water, to drink, and we had our own cups. And we also had an outhouse. We did not have a bathroom in the school. And we all had fun and there was three grades. Fourth, fifth, and sixth grade. And while we were doing, in the fifth grade, while we were doing some things, then the sixth grade would be doing some, their lessons. And the same with the fourth. And that's just about all I can remember about it. We had a good time, we played at recess, and like some of the other people said, there was lots of sand spurs. Uh, one thing, I kissed a boy at the, at the water, at the pump, and got punished for it. At the time, he was my boyfriend, I thought. Ten years old. I don't remember the punishment, but I got it. <laughs> when we, we had to walk to school, and there were a lot of cockleburrs on the side of the road, and one afternoon or morning, I don't remember, but one girl we had a fight with on the way to school, uh, going home, and she put cockleburrs in our hair. And that, other than learning something, that was quite an experience going to that small school. We moved here in 1940. We came from a little town, Greenville, Alabama. Started fourth grade at Plunkley School. Mrs. Wilson taught one, two, and three. Fourth, fifth, and sixth was taught by Miss Pearl Nelson and Miss Sarah Yenny. Um, the best things I can remember about starting fourth grade, we always started out with the Lord's Prayer. That was the first thing we had to do. Then we went with the Pledge of Allegiance to the flag. Then we started in our little books, which I really enjoyed, was uh, Jack and Jill and Dick, Jane, and Spot. And, and I thought those three characters in that book was just the most wonderful thing I had ever read, the story. Then we had like little dances that the teachers took us into the big auditorium and taught us to do the Virginia Reel. And a little bit later on in the years, a little bit of square dance in which we all learned to do also. My worst part was when I went into sixth grade, which the fourth, fifth, and sixth was all in one room. The teacher would have to take the classes one at a time. I remember the rationing steps came out. We had to bore my grandmother and grandfather's rationing stamps because we would wear our shoes out so fast. And there were so many sand spurs in the yard where we would go to play. And we would get those all in our feet. And most of the time the sand was so hot, we'd go over to the pump, which you could pump the water and wash your feet and cool them off from where the sand spurs had got in your feet. Then we used to help when we would spend the night with our grandmother and grandfather, which lived on Courtney Hill, the school buses had begun to run. And I remember three or four times of riding that school bus and it would be raining and you couldn't get up that hill. We would all have to get off that school bus and push that school bus up the hill to get to school. Then they would, the, Ms. Wilson and them would have towels there to dry all of us off one at a time at the pump where you'd pump all this water, we'd do it one at a time. Anyway, we'd find we'd find it with all of us off the school bus, pushing it up this hill to get it to the schoolhouse to get off. And that was a lot of fun, really, uh, days for us, but I enjoyed that. Then after I left sixth grade, we went into Fairhope High School which I really enjoyed. But like Clarence said, it was a lot different because we came from an area where we had to work in the fields and help out with our families, providing with groceries and things. We 
moved from uh, Upper Alabama, which was like Greenville, Alabama, and I was six years old when uh, my folks moved me to Point Clear. And we lived on uh, Confederate Rest Road, and there used to be a path uh, there uh, through the woods where we could just run through the woods to the school, to the Point Clear School. And um, I remember Miss Sarah Yenny when I was, I believe I, it was in the first grade, and um, some of the other teachers, the ones that they had mentioned, Mrs. Wilson, I remember them, but I remember Sarah Yenny the most. She was uh, like one of my favorite teachers. And even after she retired and I came back home, I would go see her until she passed away, you know, because. Uh... And some of the things I remember about the school is we had a game called volleyball. No, wall ball. It was wall ball. And we had a, a basketball. And we would stand outside and whip the ball around us and, uh, and hit the wall, you know, and we had uh, some points that we make, but I forgot the game. Then there was another game similar to the rug you have here where we would take a piece of glass and um, some three or four would be on one side and three or four on the other side and we would kick the glass and it would hit a square and we had the squares, I think they were numbered. And that was a lot of fun in the school. And we used to, uh, my mom used to pack our lunches, you know, and in little brown bags. And behind the classroom, uh, kind of a little cubby hole where we'd hang our clothes and stuff, there was a shelf where everybody would put their lunches. And sometimes we'd get the wrong lunch, which was kind of funny <laughs> because we sometimes didn't know what she had packed in our bags, you know. And uh, that was kind of fun because sometimes people would get the wrong one and then start looking through their bag and they'd have somebody else's and the teacher just said, go ahead and eat that, you know. <laughs> so we had a lot of fun about that. And um, the square dances that the school had on the weekends was a lot of fun because I liked to dance. And uh, my dad taught me how to do the Charleston and some of the dances uh, in the back you know, in the auditorium. And then we'd have plays, you know, like on Easter time and at Christmas time. And at Christmas time, it was wonderful because I always wanted to be the angel. <laughs> and mother would take and, and make me an all white uh, dress, you know, and then she'd take coat hangers and make the, the wings, you know, to go on the back. And uh, she'd make the little tiara to go on the, my head, you know, which it was nice. And then uh, at Easter time, we would have uh, little performances, uh, which was nice. But the, I like to be the one in the, the angel at Christmas. <laughs> and um, then there came a time when some of the mothers would uh, decided to come to the school and make dinners for us. And Carolyn Mac Phillips, uh, she, she had two children. Well, actually, I remember Jo going to school there, her oldest son. I don't know if, the, if uh, the younger one, I can't remember if he went there or not, but she would come to the school and they had this big old pot and she had like an electric hot plate and she would open these cans of Campbell's soup and it would be the one with the alcabets in it. And I just loved that soup. I'd be back there helping her open it up to heat it for us at lunch, you know, with crackers. And she furnished this herself. Nobody you know, paid her, you know, to, to do this. And that was a lot of fun. And uh, the halls was big in the school, I can remember. And uh, we had back houses. And uh, a lot of the kids would, the house, the school was up high enough that kids would go under the school and hide. So the teacher would have to make them all come out from under the school. <laughs> and uh, let's see, what else was it that uh, I enjoyed there? Um, oh, and one time they had a, uh, art contest and I was in that and uh, several of us did some pictures and I did a picture of Mickey Mouse and uh, uh, Ernest Langham was the one that was sponsoring it and he was going to give the one that won 10 or 15 dollars and I won the contest and that was exciting. Well uh, at Point Clear Joe kind of was jealous of me in my artwork so he took a pencil and scribbled the pencil across one of my art papers and I 
hit him in the head with a pair of scissors, which I shouldn't have did it. I was young. And of course, I know he still has a scar on his forehead. His mother was pretty upset, but she didn't do anything. And he was always trying to pull pranks on me. And so one time I had got, we had some, these little peppers, the little round peppers. And uh, I covered them with chocolate. And he thought they were chocolate covered raisins or peanuts. And I gave him a handful of those. <laughs> <laughs> and he burned his tongue in his mouth. You know, I don't even know if he remembers it or not. The area of vocational school at Robertsdale was not finished when the school year began. And we had to find vacant space to put it. And the only vacant space we could find was halfway across the county at, uh, Magno at uh, Point Clear. So we, we set that up as the area vocational school. Now, all of the area vocational uh, school teachers were new, and being artisans in, in their trades, they were, they were really not, they really hadn't had any experience as teachers. They had great experience at what they were doing, what they were teaching. For instance, automotive mechanics but no experience at all in, in teaching kids. But that particular uh, uh, teacher was also a school bus driver at Robertsdale, and it was his duty, it fell as his duty, to transport his children over to Point Clare during the course of the, of, of the half day that was devoted to vocational uh, pursuits and to bring them back at the right time and this was an afternoon class now we didn't have any books we didn't have any tools we didn't have anything to assist that teacher at the time it, we were just getting started so what we had was an inexperienced teacher a group of kids and a building that had Nothing, not, not even a cafeteria in it. You had, they had to eat at the parent school and go to that particular school. And three weeks into the school year, this particular teacher, school bus driver, had run out of soap. He just, his, his patience was taxed to the very limits to, to do his job. Now, he'd been a, a school bus driver in a lot of years, and in those years, we had to cross a lot of railroad tracks. And the state t t uh, taught you that the proper way to cross a railroad track is to find a, a, a responsible student, to come to a stop a full 15 feet before you come to the railroad track, put out that student, have the student walk the track. That was called walking the track. And he was to look down the track both ways and he was to signal the school bus driver that it was safe to come. And then he was to trot more than a school bus length down the road and wait for the bus to come. Then it was the school bus driver's duty to, ex to exercise independent judgment. He was supposed to do his looking to the right and to his left, then proceed across and pick up the, the child. Now this did two things. It made the school bus driver stop and it provided witnesses that he had actually stopped. And then it gave him an extra pair of eyes on that thing. Well, there was a young boy that lived north of Loxley who eventually came to be a member of this particular school bus driver, uh, teacher, me mechanics teacher's class. And his name was Richard. And Richard was an experienced track walker but he was walking a track that was rarely traveled. And in the course of his vast experience, Richard had never actually seen a train. He had just automatically gone out there. He had looked, did his looking. And now, when we transferred over to this other, Richard being an experienced track walker and working for his regular morning school bus driver where he had been used to perform. Again, he had to perform this service on the way home. <clears throat> well, on this particular afternoon, one hot S September afternoon, about three weeks into the school year, when everybody's temper was 
they had just reached the absolute limit because they didn't, didn't have any teaching materials. And when Richard got out at Robertsdale on his way uh, back to Robertsdale School, when he got out and crossed the tracks for the first time in his life, a locomotive appeared on the scene and Richard panicked. Instead of signaling to his school bus driver, he ran down the tracks toward the train, waving to stop the train. <clears throat> the the uh, conductor of the train looked down the tracks and he sees a yellow school bus. He doesn't know whether it's actually on the tracks or not. And he sees this student uh, frantically waving down. So he panics too. And he put on his brakes and he comes squealing up and he comes to a stop. And with that, Richard calmly turns his back on the train and wriggle in motions the school bus to cross in front of it. Well, the school bus driver had previously lost his cool and he was shouting to the, to, to, no, Richard, no, no, no. And the kids took it up, go, Richard, go, go. <laughs> this, the, the locomotive engineer, he lost his cool too. And he fell out of his train, and he came up to the school bus, and he said things to the school bus driver that he didn't learn in Sunday school. <laughs> the poor school bus driver, when he eventually got over to Robertsdale High School, <clears throat> went in to report the, the whole business to the school principal. And the school principal happened to, to have a tape recorder handy, and he taped the school bus driver's account of this, this, this affair. Later, almost a year later, I had told this story to the state transportation supervisor. And that fall at the meeting in uh, Tuscaloosa, he asked me to tell this story. And I, I told my story to all of the state school bus supervisors. One of them took the story to the national meeting of, of transportation supervisors, the state state supervisors in Washington, D.C. And later on, at a, a, a meeting in, in Denver, Colorado, of a, the uh, National Association of School Business Administrators, I happened to be present. And we had a seminar on school transportation. And one of, and, and one of the, uh, and, and the, 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 the Washington transportation man told this story at a meeting at which I was present. So it, the story went all over the United States. <laughs>